This is the fastest CPU on the planet. It costs eight thousand dollars has 64 cores and 128 threads 128 lanes of pci express gen 4 and runs on amd's latest 7 nanometer zen 3 architecture that's the same one powering their top of the line 5000 series ryzen gaming cpus its code name is epic milan and <laughs> We have two of them. Thanks to our buddy Wendell How's it over going? at Level 1 Techs. Let's take them for a spin. Cause holy shit, are they ever fast. Hey. This is the top of the line, L's and G's. The Epic 7763 that I'm holding in my hand, yet, yeah. It may only run at a mere 2.45 gigahertz base, 3.5 gigahertz boost, but don't let that fool you. This ain't no Civic, okay? This is the Hummer with the Cummins swap, all right? Man, these things are huge. I can't get over it. It's like, pretty big. Why do they have to make them so big? It's not a measuring contest. It just never gets old, you know? I think the only way to get a bigger one is to buy one on lttstore.com. Oh yeah, by the way, we're gonna have epic Threadripper shaped ones coming soon, probably in a few months. Now, of course, Yoda would happily remind all of us that size, not important. Performance is what matters. And when it comes to performance, this is pretty much the finest display of kicking someone while they're down that I think I have ever seen. And I don't even feel bad. Here's the thing. Intel's latest and greatest 10 nanometer Ice Lake Xeons, they've got some platform advantages, particularly when they're paired with Intel's Optane memory, but for purely CPU bound applications, I mean, they're not even competitive with AMD's last generation Epic Rome chips price for price, let alone the new ones. Cause here's the thing, AMD comes in with more cores, more gigahertz, more cache, and literally double the PCI Express lanes per socket. Yet AMD still prices their top dog cheaper than Intel's top dog. And you might think, well, at $8,000 a chip, 200 bucks, that's a, that's a rounding error, right? But if you're buying a thousand of them at a time, like Intel thinks you are, <laughs> sorry, Intel, not good enough for you, I guess. That works out to a quarter million dollars. Not to mention that if you're an enterprise or a data center that's upgrading your systems from say last gen on Intel, you're gonna need a whole new motherboard, which for servers generally means an entirely new system, complete with financing and warranty. How about the warranty? Like if something goes wrong, either with the hardware or software? AMD by contrast allows you to simply swap out the CPU, update your BIOS, preferably in the other order, and you're good to go. They've actually been using the exact same socket for their server platforms ever since the original Epic launched back in 2017. And this intercompatibility is fantastic. You know how I know? Because this is the exact same motherboard that we used to build our PC Mac Pro killer with our last gen Epic. Something to note before we go any farther is that server components are generally designed to be run in an extremely high airflow environment. So this cooling, <laughs> If that doesn't look suitable for a nearly 300 watt CPU, that's cause it's not. We need to get, we need to get a fan on there. Let's just throw our M.2 in here. This is by the way, the greatest thing ever. This little toolless M.2 retention mechanism. Absolutely love it. They should all have that. This Supreme X3090 is so hilarious. It's so big. We've never even tried to integrate it into an actual build. It's just it's test bench use only. Now you might notice that I'm installing it in one of the bottom PCI Express slots. Normally I would say, don't do that. But Epic has so many PCI Express lanes that every one of these 16X slots, all the M.2s, all of it is just running full fat PCIe Gen 4 with all the lanes. So it just doesn't matter. Okay. I Okay, I shouldn't quite say it doesn't matter. There are situations where the lanes might need to be reallocated and there the different chiplets and where they're attached to the IO die and all that, but mostly it's fine. Oh, there it goes, <laughs> 128 threads. Guys, this is Cinebench R23. This isn't the like weak, easy one. Now, the reason that it was so easy, TM, for AMD to maintain compatibility across generations is that under the hood, the layout of their Milan CPUs is nearly identical to their older Rome predecessors. But that's not to say that AMD didn't change anything. 
Like other Zen 3 CPUs, each of the eight chiplets here, which each contains eight cores, gets a full 32 megs of cache that is completely accessible to all eight of the cores, rather than being split into 16 megs and 16 megs. That means more efficient use of resources and lower latency. They've also increased the speed of the Infinity Fabric links within the CPU, and they've made a ton of other under the hood architectural changes that have allowed AMD to hit a surprising 19% average IPC uplift. That means that clock for clock, this thing is almost 20% faster. Oh, and they upped the maximum TDP for many of their chips, including the 7763, to allow up to 280 watts per socket. I mean, that is how you get stuff like this happening. Look where it sits relative to anything else in the database. 61,000? What? So while the CPU is running a heavy benchmark like this, it's self-reporting a peak of around 277, 278 watts of power. What that means is that, according to Wendell from Level 1 Techs, this tie-in board we have here is actually a bit on the conservative side for power delivery. The Daytona reference chassis that we've got back here can actually do closer to 285, 290 watts per socket with some power tweaks which actually sounds a lot like AMD has some overclocking headroom here. You can even tweak some IO settings, like disabling PCI Express Gen 4, or lowering your memory speeds to give a bit more of the CPU's power budget to the cores themselves, potentially improving performance. But then again, slowing down your PCI Express lanes or lowering your memory bandwidth can also hurt performance in other ways, so it's gonna depend on your application. Either way, I cannot freaking wait to see what Zen 3 based Threadripper is gonna be like, especially with the core clocks and the power limits unlocked as we assume they'll be. I suspect we're gonna need some new motherboards with new power delivery for those. <laughs> now let's have some more fun. Last time around with our Rome based 64 core Epic, Blender was only able to use half of the cores per instance. So we ran it twice with both of them running at the same time, finishing in around a minute and 14 seconds. This time around, we are having no trouble utilizing the entire CPU. And you can see, I mean, just look at this thing. It is absolutely crushing this benchmark. And the craziest part is check out these boost clocks. We are seeing in excess of 2.8 gigahertz, even as high as 3.1 gigahertz on some of these cores as it's running through this blender render. Whew. And what's interesting is our temps are so well under control. The maximum we've seen so far after about 10 minutes of Cinebench running continuously and Blender is around 70 degrees. Super reasonable. The fans aren't even ramping up. It's almost like having a gigantic CPU with the cores all spread out helps to get rid of the heat. Almost. If you can't wait for the next Threadripper and you decided you're crazy enough to use this as a workstation, check this out. I'm running this at half quality in the preview here. This is an 8K timeline with multiple 8K clips. Obviously, there's a bunch of Lumetri color being applied to it. Look how smooth that is. It's butter smooth. Can we make it all the way to full? Man, that scrubbing is still extremely responsive. Naturally, our next order of business is to play video games on it. We got uh, Apex Legends running at a cool 144 FPS average. That sounds not too bad. Maxed out at 4K. I don't have any ammo. That's okay. It's not about being good at the game. It's about having a good computer to run the game, right? So we got F1 2020 going here. And what I did is I reset the hardware info clock speed logger. So I wanna see just how high these cores will get. This is a game that unlike Apex Legends, it can actually make use of heavily, heavily multi-core CPUs. So we're gonna go ahead and, uh, okay, there we go, that's more like it. Now we're, oh yeah, we're driving now. We're driving. 1% lows at around 150 FPS according to FrameView over here. So can you game on an Epic server? Yes. You can. Ah, I need to break. Ah, I'm broken. Once again, the point is not how good I am at the game. The point is this thing is sick. Oh, I crashed. So max, we managed to hit 3.5 gigahertz in games. And yes, of course, we're gonna play Crisis 3. It is kind of amazing how good this game still looks. Is it not? Freaking Crisis 3. Even your hand model like looks really good. Yep. 
It's amazing how well this game has aged. It's, it's running at about 60 FPS at 4K. <laughs> you know, this is a really quiet server. Mm -hmm. I'm impressed. Oh, uh, you know, <laughs> I think it might be a little misleading. <laughs> All right, here it goes. 264 core epics, Cinebench R23. Sorry, it's sorry like, Riley. It's like 120 watts of fans. What? Yeah, yeah it, <laughs> it's really fast though. What the hell? Holy crap, well, Oh, okay, oh. okay, let's. Are you just gonna tease me like that? It ran in 12 seconds. I wanna see task manager. It takes oh. longer to queue up the test than it takes to run the test. Hold on, I'm not even gonna be able to get it up in time. Dang it, 91,000. Oh, what? That's weak. It should be able to do like 110. Really? Yeah. Oh. All right, new attempt. Wendell sent us over a couple tuning parameters. Here we go. 98,623. That's not quite the 100K plus that Wendell managed to get on his own with more tinkering and more tuning. But I think it goes to show a couple of things. Number one is these things are so fast, they can tear through anything. Not made for gaming, who cares? They're gonna game pretty good. And number two is that once you get to this level of hardware, it's not just plug and play, ladies and gentlemen. You actually have to know what the freak you're doing. Can you imagine running like 16 quad-core virtualized gaming stations off of one of these? Like uh, maybe in our LAN center. Get subscribed to so make sure you don't miss that. And while you're down there, let us know if you had any other cool ideas for a project we could use one of these bad boys for. Just like I'm gonna let you know what you could use our sponsor for. Ting Mobile sponsored today's video and they want you to hear their message over the sound of these fans. You can save by switching to Ting. That's right, they've got unlimited talk and text for just $10, data plans starting at $15 with their new Set 12 plan that has 12 gigs of data for 35 bucks and unlimited for 45 a month. If you're looking for a deal, Ting Mobile is offering their unlimited plan for 25 a month for the first three months right now. And if you liked their previous pay for only what you use plans, they're still here. They're called Ting Mobile's Flex Plans and they charge just $5 a gig. Data can even be shared if you have a family plan so you can connect more phones to save more. You get the same nationwide coverage in the US and award-winning customer service, and pretty much any phone will work with Ting Mobile. So check them out at linus.ting.com and get a $25 credit. Now, if you're looking for something else to watch, maybe check out, oh, we had a lot of fun building an ITX 64 core build with our Rome equivalent to this CPU. That thing was tiny, powerful.